Now that I have explained to you the ubiquity of the normal distribution, its regular appearance in human measurements, you may begin to hope or even expect that all of the distributions that we will encounter will be normal curves. But if that is your expectation, you will have to get used to disappointment. Princess Bride reference there. Oh, are you? No one of consequence. I must get used to disappointment. Because many curves, perhaps most curves, are not normal distributions, we need a way to talk about the shape of distributions when they differ from normality. The first difference that we may find is that the scores in the distribution are more spread out than we would have expected. Or we may find the scores are more closely packed together than we expected. The name for the peaked or flatness of a curve is called kurtosis. When the scores are very close together, then the curve becomes peaked. We call this a leptocurtic curve. Think of the scores leaping up, leptocurtic. When the scores are very spread out, the curve becomes flat, like a plate. We call this platocurtic. Plat rhymes with flat. Platocurtic is a flattened curve in the shape of a plate. A normal curve is mesocurtic. Its kurtosis is medium. So kurtosis can be measured as leptocurtic, tall, platocurtic, flat, or mesocurtic, medium. Kurtosis is caused by the variability in the distribution. Another thing that can happen to a curve is when the scores are pulled out in only one direction. When the scores are dragged down, or rather out, in only one direction, this creates a skew in our curve. Therefore, we need to talk about the skewness of our distribution. Negatively skewed distributions have a higher than expected frequency of high or extreme scores on the right, and the tail is pulled out to the left end of the number line on the x-axis. For example, if we were interested in the running speeds of football players, we might find a lot of very fast players, high scores, but only a few slower runners, low scores. Skewness is always caused by outliers in the direction of the tail. In a positively skewed distribution, the higher than expected frequencies are on the low end of the curve. The tail is pulled back on the right or positive end of the number line. If we were measuring reaction time, we would expect to have a large number of very quick responses, low scores, and only a few slower responses, taking more time further up the positive end of that scale. Skewed distributions are not normal. How can you remember which direction is positive or negative when we talk about skewness? StatsCow tells us that the skew is in the tail. Skewness is caused by outliers, extreme scores in the tail of the distribution. The direction that the tail is pulled out, positive or negative, is the direction of the skew. Here are two curves. This first one is positively skewed, and the second is negatively skewed. The top curve is positively skewed because the tail is pulled out on the right, or the positive direction of the number line. The bottom curve is negatively skewed. The tail is pulled out on the negative, or left end, of the number line. Both of these curves show us what happens to the mean and the median in the case of kurtosis. In both of these curves, you can see what happens to the mean and the median in the case of skewness. Both of them are pulled in the direction of the outlier, but the mean is pulled further. That is because the mean is more susceptible to the outlier that is causing the skewness. Mathematically, we can calculate a measure of skewness by comparing the mean and the median. And this will give us a value that we can use to quantify the skewness of our curve. But there are other things that can go wrong with our normal curve. 
Instead of having one peak, sometimes we have two peaks. This occurs when there is more than one most frequently occurring score. We call this type of curve bimodal. A curve can be bimodal when there really are two most frequently occurring scores. For instance, when is the best time to go fishing? At what time of day will you catch the most fish? Probably early in the morning, and then in the evening when the sun is going down. In the middle of the day, when the sun is at its height, you will catch fewer fish. So if we plot the number of fish caught, we will see a peak in the morning at dawn and another peak in the evening at dusk. This would be a true bimodal distribution. On the other hand, we might have a bimodal distribution when there are actually two distributions overlying each other. When we had both males and females on the football field and we were comparing heights, we saw that there was a distribution for males and another distribution for females. The distributions overlapped. Some females were taller than some males, but the average heights were taller for males. They really were two distinct distributions that should be separated before being analyzed. A multimodal distribution has three or more most frequently occurring scores. Now you may wonder why we don't call it a trimodal distribution or a quadrimodal distribution, four peaks. The answer is that when we start getting three, four, five modes, there is something very wrong in our data set. Three or more modes is multimodal and it's messed up. We need to figure out what is going on before we try to analyze those data. Rectangular distributions have the same frequency for all scores. If you roll a single die 100 times, how many times would you expect to get a one? Well, about one-sixth of the time. In fact, you would expect to get each of the scores, one through six, approximately one-sixth of a time. That is a rectangular distribution. Once you add a second die, however, your distribution will begin to look more normal. Rectangular distributions have exactly the same frequency for all scores and do not have tails. Before we conclude, there is one more thing. One more thing that I want to tell you about the normal curve. And that is that the normal curve can be overlaid with a number line. And this is where things get really interesting and quite useful. If we have a normal curve, we can add the value of the mean right in the middle where it belongs. And in this example, we're going to imagine that our mean is 50. So then we could lay out a number line with four-point delineations. Half of our scores will always be above the mean, or above 50. The remaining half of the scores will always be below 50. That is what a measure of central tendency tells us. It is the point at which half of the scores fall above and half of the scores fall below. The next thing that we could do is measure the proportion of the scores that fall within a certain range above or below the mean. The next thing that we could do is measure the proportion of the scores that fall within a certain range above or below the mean. The proportion is the total area under the normal curve that corresponds to the relative frequency of those scores. To better understand this, let's return to our picture of the people standing on the football field. Remember that everyone, 100%, are standing below the rope that represents our distribution. We want to know the proportion of people who are between 5 foot 6 and 5 foot 9 inches tall. We ask everyone who is in those rows, 5 foot 6, 7, 8, and 9, to stay where they are. Everyone else, please leave the field. So how many people are in these four rows? Divide the number of people in the four rows by the total number of people, and you have a proportion. This is the proportion of people who are in that range underneath the distribution. It would also be the relative frequency of the number of people in that range. And this is going to become a very useful technique when we talk about z-scores. But for now, just remember what we've learned about the frequency table and specifically how the relative frequency relates to what we know about the normal curve.